Yeah, what Vladimir Putin is doing west of Ukraine, that's the issue today. Here on Global Connections, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and the handsome young man is Carl Ackerman. Dr. Carl Ackerman, if you please, a history professor and more. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. And you know, as I always say about you, you're the, you're the immense extraordinaire. Um, okay, we're going to get a dictionary and try to help people <laughs> out on that. <laughs> so, um, see, I, I have so much to talk to you about today, Carl, but let me start with my observation over the past hour of Rachel Maddow trying to make sense of uh, Cassidy Hutchins and her testimony in, in the Select Committee. I mean, it, it, seems, uh, it seems clear that uh, Trump knew there were people with weapons uh, on January 6th. Um, and he knew they were trying to get into the Capitol, um, and he he ordered that the MAGA machines, MAG, MAG machines, that is the TSA, you know, uh, x-ray machines, be taken down uh, so that they could get in uh, with the weapons. That's really an interesting revelation. And then... Um, it, it, it appears that uh, he, he, he said that the weapons wouldn't hurt him, but the implication is that the weapons would hurt somebody else. Um, and then finally, he, he, tried to, he, he tried to join them. He, he said he was going to join them, and he tried to join them. And in fact, he got into an altercation um, with Secret Service on the way back to the Oval, Oval Office. Um, and she was uh, either directly or indirectly a witness to all of this. Um, and there's more to come uh, as as we left this unfolding story. She was about to testify <clears throat> about why he wanted to get to the Capitol himself, uh, together with his armed friends. Um, and you know what? It, what it uh, what it tells me uh, in my preparation, my thought for this show about Vladimir Putin and uh, his moves west of Ukraine is that um, you know we have an emergence of autocrats and what trump was doing was um, you know trying to emerge as as the <clears throat> as the president no matter what the uh, vote said They're trying to emerge as a, the, the the single leader of, of of the western world no matter what the vote said trying to avoid the peaceful transfer of power that's what he's trying to do that's what autocrats do and, and that's what vladimir putin does so um, he has emerged through uh, mostly trick <clears throat> uh, over the past several years. And he is an autocrat in Russia. And there are others too, Viktor Orban, for example, and, and others all around. <clears throat> so we have an emergence of autocrats. And, and, and that kind of helps us understand what Putin is doing in moving west uh, into Ukraine. Um, so the, you and I have talked before, Carl, about various places that were at risk, vulnerable places, aside from Ukraine itself. There's, Be there's uh, Belarus, uh, which uh, Trump has moved uh, nuclear weapons into Belarus, and he owns Belarus. He, he controls the autocratic uh, uh, president there. <clears throat> and of course, there's uh, Kaliningrad, uh, which is uh, on, on the, um, I guess, the, uh, the ocean, the Baltic Sea. And um, he's... Um, He's been threatening Lithuania um, because Lithuania has uh, stopped uh, the uh, uh, flow of Russian um, Russian supplies, I guess, to Kaliningrad uh, on the Baltic Sea. He's made uh, threats to uh, let's see to uh, Moldova and that little slice of land, Transnistria. Uh, that little slice of land between Russia and uh, Moldova, and he's um, he's got this strange relationship with um, um, uh, uh, the autocrat in Hungary, um, and uh, he's made threatening comments to Romania. So, <clears throat> if you wondered, um, you know what what he was all about and what his next plan is, uh, it certainly seems. Um, that he's not going to stop in, in, in the Donbass. Uh, he's going to move through Ukraine, if you let him, if we let him. And he's going to threaten everybody around, including all of the EU and Western Europe. Um, uh, he's going to threaten everyone to try to you know, minimize the support they give to Ukraine. 
That seems to be his style. But I guess we're here, Carl, to try to figure out what moves he's he's going to make. So far, this is rhetoric. Hmm? Uh, what moves he's going to make that that are true threats, and what he will follow through with as the what do you want to call it? The the autocrat of Eastern Europe. So your thoughts about all of that, please, Carl. Well, you know. Jay, you began in, in a, a wonderful way, and you were, you were beginning to talk about Donald Trump, and we all should know about Donald Trump from reading Mary Trump's book. Mary Trump, you know, wrote um, a, you know, tell-all, and, you know, Donald Trump's treatment of his older brother was horrendous, and his growing up and his, you know, his paternal influence was horrible and um, only rewarded him for doing kind of dastardly things. and. Um, you know, talk to him about, uh, you know, if you don't win, you're nothing at all. And that's the deep sort of seated uh, psychosis that uh, Donald Trump has. And if you move it over to Vladimir Putin, and these guys were good friends and, you know, good psychopaths together, um, you know, Vladimir Putin lost, uh, was there when the Soviet Union dismantled, um, uh, basically in 1989, and he's never forgotten this, and that's the way he operates in the world. He wants to retor, you know, return the old Soviet Union. So those are the parameters. Now, um, in talking about the great things that you're talking about, which is the West and Transnistria, and, and I'll, I'll begin there, because Transnistria, is, what the plan is, is to take the other parts of the southern part of Ukraine near the Baltic, you know, cities like Odessa, then build a land bridge there you know, to Transnistria, carving out more of Ukraine. I doubt that's going to happen because the Ukrainian fighters are doing counterattacks in that south eastern part of Ukraine. So, and they haven't taken Odessa yet. And that's such a beautiful city. And, of course, it's celebrated in film with Potemkin, which you well know, my friend who is so well know, who knows so much about film. So, um, Eisenstein, yeah, you know, with the, with the Potemkin. Um, but the the thing is with, Kaliningrad, that's what I'd like to spend most of our time today, if it's okay with you. And that's, you know, that's an enclave. And, you know, an enclave is just something that is not, you know, contiguous with, with the rest of Russia. And, you know, the biggest enclave that I know about is Alaska. You know, I mean, it's, you know we, 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 we do not, you know, the United States, the 48 states do not continue uh, up into Alaska. And I mean, I, I don't know if you'd call Hawaii an enclave, too, because we're separated by a body of water. So... Anyway, like a large body of water, and, you know, just as an aside, it always makes me laugh, Jay, when pilots are leaving Hawaii, and they're obviously not from Hawaii, and they say this is a nonstop flight to the West Coast. You better hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, Kaliningrad, you know, this is really an interesting um, sliver, and I think the proper name was Konigsberg, which is... Um, you know, the German uh, center. And, you know, what's interesting about this particular area is that Konigsberg was, uh, was the capital of the Prussian Empire before, you know, Germany was unified in 1870. And then it switched to Berlin. Um, so this has been, a, you know, a, um, an enclave of Russia only since about 1946 when the Allies gave this territory, you know, whether to protect against another German onslaught or whatever. But, you know, it was part of the bargaining process. Uh, probably at Yalta, but I don't know where it actually, the bargaining process took place, but I know it began in 1946. And of course, the reason the Russians are interested in it is because they don't want to take their ships and launch from St. Petersburg because, you know, um, St. Petersburg, part of the ocean, freezes over. And um, I have a funny story, Jay, and I'm going to share it with you and your viewers today. Uh, when I was in uh, Leningrad at that time in the former Soviet Union, I was flying a a stun kite in that icy area, and was actually uh, walking along, um, walking along the uh, the ocean there. And um, I was walking along because it was frozen. And I had a Russian come up to me, and, and sort of the great Russian nationalism that Putin shares. Of course, Putin's much worse. A Russian came up and said to me in Russian, "You know, you're American, yes." And I said, "Yes." He said, "You know, your kite is not as good as the Russian. The Russian kite goes up and stays there. Your kite is." twisting all around. And I tried to explain to him it was a stun kite, but it didn't work. So there you go. But anyway, that's, but that's to explain the Baltic fleet is in uh, Kaliningrad. And so they want that port. And that, you know, that's a huge economic moneymaker like, like, uh, like the electronics in Hong Kong. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, a huge moneymaker. And, you know, the Russians don't want to mess with it. It's much freer than 
most places in Russia because it's not contiguous. And um, well, how does it work, Carl? Because it's <coughs> hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers west of Russia itself. It's it's completely disconnected. It's uh, it's bordered by Lithuania and um, and Poland, as I recall. Right. It and, is. It's <coughs> uh, 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 Poland is to the west and Lithuania is to the east, and it's. You know, I think that, you know, um, there are Russian banks there. It has a, you know, it has a great um, relationship with the EU. And so you have goods and services. And this is where Lithuania comes up, is that Lithuania, because of the March 2022 dictum um, by the uh, EU, um, and Lithuania is part of NATO. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's part of NATO for a while. I mean, I think about 2005, but I don't know for sure. Don't quote me on that, although, you know, I'm giving that number, 2004, 2005. So they're just following the dictums. And so what they're doing is they're cutting off, I think, um, steel and one other product um, from, you know, doing going into the markets of uh, Kaliningrad. And, of course, this disrupts the Russian economy. The Russians make a huge amount of money. And I imagine the bank transfers are what goes on. I think everything's electronic. And... Um, the main um, source of revenue, uh, I think, are food resources, um, and whether those come from the Ukraine or they come from uh, Russia, and also tourism. And of course, both those things are being hurt by this war. I mean, all the food stuff from the Ukraine. And so. Well, you know, Russia can't do anything without crossing uh, uh, Lithuania uh, and or Poland. And, you know, those trains go across uh, you know, the two Baltic states. and. Um, and in order to get into Kaliningrad, so they're they're in they're in deep kimchi. But anyway, the well, what, what's interesting about this? You're right, uh, Jay. And um, the Russians, you know, reacted to this Lithuanian um, uh, observance of Euro policy, European Union policy, by saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna launch something great against Lithuania. Now, um, this has happened. Um, you know, they're not gonna. You know, once they Cross the line of attacking a um, NATO country. You know that's that's the line in the sand that Joe Biden has 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 um, established, and he's get, he means he means it. I think that you know Joe Biden is not someone who's going to lift this uh, line in the sand. I mean, he's going to, or I should I don't want to use the proper metaphor. He's not going to move this line in the sand and create another line. He's going to have to move, and he's going to have to move militarily. So. What happened yesterday in Kaliningrad is there was a cyber attack, and um, the cyber attack failed, but it was a huge cyber attack, and I think that's the way Russia is going to go now. And um, with Transnistria to go farther south uh, to Moldova, and for the, those viewers who don't know where this is, it's in the eastern part of Moldova, bordering Ukraine. Um, they took out, you know, two radio outlets. Um, or radio television outlets, you know, with, with missiles. Uh, but there hasn't been any kind of major movement there. But the, the, you know, Transnistria is really not as significant as Kaliningrad, which, you know, brings in, as I said, the kind of um, hard currency, the money, the, the you know, the, um, the kind of trade. And, of course, you know, it, it borders on the Baltic Sea, and the Baltic Sea is, you know, doesn't freeze over, and so except farther north, you know. And so... Um, uh, I'm sorry, the North Sea, the Baltic freeze, the Baltic Sea does freeze over farther north, but the North Sea does not. So, um, you know, this is a big threat to Russia, and Russia sees it as something that is, you know, um, sovereign Russian territory. But, you know, I, I don't think that even in his craziest moment, uh, Vladimir Putin is going to try to attack a NATO country. If he does, you know, all bets are off, and then the the American military, and the, especially the American military air force begins to um, work and, you know, our missiles work and, you know, we're very efficient as a military But you power. see how cute this is. Um, this is not an attack on uh, a kinetic attack, if you will, a military attack on Lithuania. Um, it's a hacking attack. And it's not clearly established in law or in practice, international law of practice or the law of war. Uh, that a hacking attack is a is a is is a warlike attack, um, or that it would violate the NATO you know protection agreement. Um, so it's cute, it's cute, and it's his style now. It's his way of um, 
threatening. It's, it's kind of international terrorism is what it is. And we know for a fact that it's a, it's state, it's a state terrorist. It's, it's a state act by Vladimir Putin, for sure. But I guess the question I put to you is, uh, uh, at some point, you know, you do get to consider it uh, a war, a war attack. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a kinetic attack if you bring down power plants, if you bring down uh, government institutions and so forth, the way he has done in other places, for example, in uh, U Ukraine itself. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, today, you know, if you watch the news this morning, you know, he attacked, you know, there were some missiles that went into, you know, a shopping center, you know, I don't know what kind of danger that poses. And I, I said before, I'm not so convinced that some of these things are planned, because I think that, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in the, in, in the Russians' ability to be picture perfect as, and even, even the United States is picture perfect, but I think we have much more control about where our, our missiles land. Um, but uh, in any case, I think that, you, you know, the... Um, the Russians are, you know, launching this this counteroffensive in the Donbas region, and that's his that's his overall plan. And you know, the West is secondary, but you know, he's going to let people know um, by this cyber attack. And you know, cyber attacks are part of the arsenal not only of of Russia but also of China. I mean, China does it all the time with our our banks from Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, these Marxist Leninist countries, uh, of course which include Cuba and, you know, North Korea, they're never going to be our friends because uh, they have a different ideology. And they, you know, I remember we had a colleague, Jay, you and I, who was trying to suggest that democratic centralism was something like democracy. Well, it certainly is not, and it never has been. It's never been historically. But I think that what's, what's interesting um, is that uh, Putin has had to, Vladimir Putin, President Vladimir Putin, has to, has, has had to, as you suggested, uh, resort to um, cyber war. Well, it's a hybrid war, you know, just yeah. as uh, Biden doesn't want to have a, an expanded kinetic war. Uh, uh, Putin is afraid of that, and uh, he uses these clever mechanisms. Now, on 60 Minutes, in the past two weeks, there have been three instances of interest, and I'll mention them to you and see what you think. Uh, number one is the oligarchs have... Uh, with their fabulous money, they have bought neighbors, neighbor, neighborhoods in London. <clears throat> Some of the most expensive properties in the whole country, they bought them. And um, I don't know if they live there, but they're holding their money outside of Russia by buying these, these properties. Um, the other thing they've done is they, they've made huge political contributions to members of parliament. And they tried to, in fact, one of them was recently sworn in as a member of parliament. That really is scary. And other members of parliament are saying, what's going on here? <clears throat> they're trying to achieve influence over parliament. Uh, they're trying to soften us up to Russian aggression. Uh, they're working it from the inside. You know, talk about hybrid war. Wow. Um, nothing like hollowing out the country and, and affecting its um, you know, it's it's uh, it's government. And that's one of the things that uh, was reported. The other was uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, who is an absolute oligarch, a, a, a terrible dictator who makes his uh, uh, adversaries disappear the same way that Navalny makes his has disappeared in, in Russia. <clears throat> Somebody runs against you or speaks against you, you you find a way to throw them in the back end of the prison or you disappear them so they are never heard of again, which is happening in, according to this article uh, in Nicaragua. Further, we find that Russia is investing funds in infrastructure in Nicaragua uh, and other Latin American countries and in African countries. And, you know, when I say hybrid, I mean hybrid to the fullest extent you could possibly define the term. He's everywhere. And I don't know if it costs him a lot of money because he doesn't have any money. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Russian bank is now in default as of last week of its uh, national obligations to the um, investment community, the global investment community. So I guess what I'm, I'm saying and asking is, uh, you know, this is also part of the hybrid war, uh, as well as the rhetoric by which he and the hacking, the cyber attacks by which he attacks countries that um, 
portend to support Ukraine. Uh, he's also building a, a kind of coalition of, of autocrats. Uh, Viktor Orban, just one of them, uh, Daniel Ortega, another one, and God knows what he's got going in the UK. Um, and so what, what we have here is uh, it's terrorism, but it's also mm, mm, uh, autocratic coalition building. Um, doesn't this, or my question is, does this help him in dealing with the Ukraine invasion? I think wherever he could find a, um, the, the initial answer to your question is yes, it does help him. Um, minimally, I think, um, and this is why. Um, today in Madrid, um, in NATO, um, you know, both um, uh, uh, Sweden and Finland uh, took one step closer. Uh, there, there was no um, uh, uh, disagreement on the part of Turkey, etc., to NATO uh, membership. So people around the world, I mean, this is the critical aspect for Russia right now, is to prevent NATO membership for two countries that had no intention before the Ukrainian invasion uh, wanted to remain neutral. So that's that's something right on Vladimir Putin's border. And, you know, he can't get away from this. And if they become NATO members, you know, it's sort of game over in the sense of what he wants to do north of it. So that's one thing. You know, there was recently a Chilean election and, you know, the progressive came in, not a Marxist Leninist like, you know, Daniel Ortega and his Sandinista crew in Nicaragua, um, but, you know, actually, you know, someone that is, uh, you know, progressive, but willing to listen to, you know, he's of the Bernie Sanders type. You know, Bernie Sanders doesn't want to get rid of all of capitalism, despite what some of his followers think. You know, he, he likes, you know, the, the richness of America. And while he's a, a socialist, I think that, you know, in our own contemporary world, socialism means sort of like more government help. You know, it's not like, you know, he, he wants, you know, the United States government to take over McDonald's. That would be silly and stupid. Uh, you know, both of what the Bolsheviks did in, in October 1917. You know, just, you know, really out there. <laughs> and we saw what happened. But, um, you know, I, I think that I'm, I'm not as uh, pessimistic. I, I think that the people that are much more influential are the Chinese, who have much more money, much more uh, willpower to do things. And, you know, if you look at the major um, uh, sort of state that relied on, on the Soviet Union for many years, and that was um, Cuba, or as the Cubans say, Cuba, uh, you know, uh, there, you know, there they, you know, they want to, they're trying to find, I think, a hybrid road because, you know, they don't want um, all these sanctions put on them because they, they have realized that, especially with Fidel Castro gone, that, you know, things are not going all well in, in their, you know, sugar plantation uh, economy and they're trying to do other things. And ev eventually, I hope that Cuba will return to sort of the Western framework of, uh, democracy and capitalism. And, you know, capitalism takes on many forms. And we have, a, you know, a good capitalist system in the United States, but perhaps a better one is in Sweden, where they have more taxes, dare I say that, and more things are taken care of. And I always, I always laugh, you know, both on the right and the left, you know, the right complaining about, um, um, in all these countries that have oligarchs, the right complaining about you know, government inter intervention, but you know, when there's when there when there companies are about to go under, like the auto industry, what do they look for? They look for the government. And of course, people complaining about um, socialism. I mean, you know, how are how, how are we, in most of our states schools supplied, or policemen paid, or firemen paid, or you know, public hospitals? You know, it's like you know, get with the program here. You know, it's just you know, or you know, garbage pickup. You know, in other words, it's it's. It's a form of socialized uh, uh, framework with us all contributing something, as you know, with our taxes and getting answers. I think well, people just have to as labels. Just as Russia is uh, defaulting on its international financial obligations, um, the, the uh, visibly the quality of life of the average Russian uh, is declining um, right now, and in, in, in relatively short order. I mean, he can. Uh, ignore the sanctions, try to bypass the sanctions, using using clever mechanisms to bypass them on a sort of a national fiscal approach. But the fact is that the ordinary Russians are, um, their quality of life is declining. And so I guess um, if he had his way and he took Ukraine, which is a logical possibility, I mean, I, I hope it doesn't happen. I don't think it'll happen, but if he does, 
take Ukraine and, and threaten all the countries around it. We can name them as, you know, there's a half a dozen or maybe more uh, countries that through these threats and cyber attacks and God knows what clever and draconian things he can think of. Um, that's another world order. That's, that's, that's the old fashioned Vladimir Putin, Eastern Europe model. Be damned the public, be damned quality of life, be damned capitalism, um, be, be damned thinking about democracy. There wouldn't be any, it would be back to um, the Russia, the Soviet Union of the Cold War uh, and the Eastern Europe of the Cold War. And my question to you, and you know, you've had uh, a lot of experience in Eastern Europe, will Eastern Europe in the year 2022 or 2023 uh, tolerate that? Will the countries, will Russia, the, the citizens of Russia tolerate that? Uh, will the citizens of these other countries that are vulnerable, that, that could get swept up in Putin's grand plan, would they tolerate that? And if not, what would happen? Well, you know, I, I think the Ukraine is a good example. I mean, they, they've, you know, not had that many years of democracy, but it really stuck. And for the younger generation, that's the, what they've known. So my answer to you is, um, twofold. One for many countries, I would I would include Poland, you know, all the Baltic states um, um, here. Um, Hungary is iffy. Um, uh, Belarus is definitely pro Russia, but depending on which, um, you know, um, East Germany is now part of West Germany, so it's just Germany. So I would I would say uh, my my answer for the most of the states it would be no. I think, and no one wants to return to the scarcity of the of the former Soviet Union. I mean that was that that's a proven uh, uh, failure, you know, in terms of Marxist Leninism. Uh, too bad that um, that that uh, that North Korea and the Sandinistas are not taking note of that. But you know, people don't read their history books, unfortunately. And uh, <laughs> you and I both lament that wonderful mensch, uh, Jay Fidel. <laughs> well, uh, you know, but what that su what that suggests to me is that the countries that are vulnerable all know the history. They've been there. They have been part of the Soviet. Um, you know, Eastern Europe model, and they know how hard it was on their families, and they're not about to go back to that. And uh, even in Germany, and they're not about to go back to the old Germany. Um, they they remember, uh, and they remember how it didn't work out in any way for them. Um, I guess I guess the question though is uh, when you when you when you when you conclude that, and you conclude your point early on in this discussion that. NATO is not going to permit them to invade, and Biden is not going to permit them to invade, quote, not one inch of, of, of NATO territory. Uh, where does that leave us with all these threats, threats of, um, you know, the cyber attacks, the nuclear threats, um, and his, his, his threats against the civilian populations, governmental institutions, um, shopping centers, God. Um, and not to say nothing about atrocities and, and war crimes, where does that leave him? Um, is he is he barking up a tree on this? Is he going to go nowhere, <clears throat> or does this somehow serve his purposes? I you know, Jay, um, my answer it's it's in Putin's hands now. I I think that you know if he um, decides to attack a NATO country. Um, he's going to get the full retaliation of the United States and and NATO. I mean, it's not just the United States. It's countries, you know, really well, um, countries that have weapons like the Germans. And so they're going to they're going to be in um, deep trouble, the Russians. So I'm not sure he's going to um, do that. I think that yeah, I think what you're suggesting is that he's going to try to do um, cyber attacks. And he's also going to try to unify all the sort of crazies in the world. Um, including, you know, the Sandinistas and the North Korean government and, you know, um, and, and, and unite the independent countries that have received help from Russia, like India, uh, which is, doesn't, I mean, India is a full-fledged democracy, but they've gotten aid from Russia, and so has, you know, a lot of, a lot of the countries in, in Africa, and also some of the countries in Latin America, you know, but, um, I, you know, I mean, every, all someone has to do is look at the Cuba experiment. <laughs> when they stop giving, you know, Cuba money, look what happened to the Cuban economy. So, you know, it's just, it's the writing's on the wall. Um, and I think, 
um, Vladimir Putin um, at the concluding comment should remember Afghanistan. This is not a winning proposition. Yeah. But let me, <clears throat> let me, uh, yeah, tripping off that though, one other point I would like to discuss with you is this. Um, in Afghanistan, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the mothers and daughters and sisters and grandmothers, the, they opposed having their boys brought back in body bags from Afghanistan. And, and they put pressure on him. And it was him. Uh, on the other hand, he handled, um, you know, the area south of, uh, I guess, Georgia was one of them. And um, um, that, yeah, Chechnya. Uh, he handled that differently, and the world never really knew. And, and maybe, you know, the Russian people never really knew what was going on. And he lied to them and, and caused these provocations to happen, um, and uh, then used those provocations to enhance his own, his own power. He was much more adept uh, in, in that phase of his you know, power expansion. Um, and so right now you have a situation where one of his goals is to keep on going. It's a war of attrition. Um, it's, it's a war without end. It's a war where he says, I'm, I can, whatever you throw at me, uh, I'll beat it and I'll keep going. And you guys are going to get tired. And uh, <clears throat> Western Europe, you know, is, is every indication of getting tired of this. Uh, they're worried about gas prices and their economies. Uh, the U.S., the same thing. Uh, if a guy like Trump wins in the next election or even this fall, um, you know, the other side of the equation may be a nationalistic approach. We don't care about Ukraine. We, we don't want to get in, in any foreign adventures. He's counting on that. He's hoping for that. He's planning for that, taking every step he can to make it a war of long term attrition where we take it off the top of our priority list. And um, I worry about that. Uh, I think he could win that simply by by keeping keeping the siege going, so to speak. Your thoughts? You know, Jay, there was an indigenous Russian group, um, indigenous meaning the Russian people um, themselves, that began a, a mostly mothers um, opposition to Chechnya uh, because they're exactly as you said, their their sons were coming home in body bags. And so I think as this war gets longer, um, and it's long right now, um, and as people return with information um, from what's been going on, you know, they go into a neighborhood, there's no fascists, you know, and so, uh-oh, you know, I've been told something and it's not true. In the same sort of discouraging way that um, many um, veterans from Vietnam came home and said, look, you know, we're not... We're not, you know, uh, well, many were saying we weren't fighting the, the war in the right way, but some were saying also that you know, this was a war that we couldn't win. So I think that's, I think it's, you know, I think the longer the war goes on, the worse it is for Vladimir Putin. I think that's why he's um, trying to store up the Donbass region. And, and again, my, my, sorry, I just moved my computer here, but um, I accidentally, um, I, I, what I w would say is that I think that Vladimir Putin is on his way to, lose the initial support he had in Russia. And I think he's going to lose it big time if he continues in the, in the long run um, with this war. I mean, he, remember, they pulled out of Chechnya and they pulled out of Afghanistan. And, um, you know, they pulled out of, Af out of Afghanistan because they realized that they could not produce anything, you know, it's a model Soviet state there because people had a different ideology um, based on, you know, some ideas of um, Islamic philosophy. So, you know, I think it's 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 a no win for um, Vladimir Putin. And uh, there was a song in the '60s that was written by Country Joe and the Fish. I feel like I'm fixing to die, and I'm <laughs> I'm waiting for some smart American to translate this into Russian. And instead of um, uh, you know, come on, all you big strong men, Uncle Sam's got his needs some help again, and saying you know, uh, instead of Uncle Sam, you know, Uncle Vladimir Putin that needs the help again. To put down your books and pick up a gun, we're going to have a whole lot of fun, as the song goes. Uh, but that's just my my last rendition of Country Joe in terms of what Vladimir Putin is going to face in the future. Well, one thing is clear, Carl, and that is we can't we can't forget Ukraine. 
despite Vladimir's wishes on that we will forget Ukraine, uh, and despite the fact that we have all this Michigas, um, Michigas is also in that dictionary, uh, going on in Washington, which 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 sucks up sucks up all the oxygen. When I when I think of the good policy we can do, the good steps we can take, um, all the good legislation that could be passed, and instead we spend our time um, fighting around Trump and dealing with Trump and dealing with the, uh, the 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 GOP and QAnon and the like, the conservative movement is I don't know if it's the right term. We are wasting time, and we are also wasting public attention. And I think that always. Ukraine should be right at the top because it represents the liberal world order, and we need to be concerned about that. Therefore, I suggest that you and I check back and continue this discussion on a regular basis, Carl. That would be that would be wonderful, Jay. And it's you know it's always nice to you know kibitz with you. And um, uh, I will end by just saying that um, Vladimir Putin combines what uh, the American History Channel called um, Louis the Sixteenth. A schlub, but he's also a schmuck. He's, 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 he combines both words, schmuck and schlub. Okay, there you have it. It's time for all our viewers to go uh, look at their Yiddish dictionaries. <laughs> there we go. Understand how we're leaving this. Thank you, Carl Ackerman. So, so nice to talk to you. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.